Hi everyone, I'm Dean Friedman of the New York School of Synthesis, here to tell you some strange and unusual things about the new DX7. First off, uh, I'll just give you an idea of what we're going to discuss. We'll start with the four different play modes, and then we'll cover some data management, show you how to store patches and exchange information from cartridge to internal memory, as well as from disk to internal memory and back. Then we'll jump right into the voice editing, continue to performance editing, and finally winding up with examining how MIDI is implemented on this machine. Let's begin by taking a quick glance at the front panel. We'll start over here on the left. Here are performance controls, pitch bend wheel, modulation wheel, our master volume slider, and two continuous sliders, one and two. Continuous slider two doubles as a data entry fader. This section over here is our control center. We select our play mode or our edit mode, and we change the values of whatever parameter we're editing. This is our display. It keeps you posted minute to minute as far as what's happening in the machine, and it'll ask you questions now and again to coax you through different routines. And finally, this section is where we select our voices or the different edit parameters with which we edit those voices. Let's talk about the play modes. There are four different play modes, single, dual, split, and performance. The last one, performance, represents different configurations of the first three. But let's start with the single mode. But wait just a moment. Before we start experimenting with the different voice modes, make sure that the light above the pan button is lit and that the one above the poly mono button is not, for reasons that you are shortly to discover. The new DX7 contains 64 voices in its internal memory. With a properly formatted cartridge, you have access to an additional 64 voices. We access the voices by pressing the single voice mode button, then selecting either cartridge or internal, and choosing from either the first set of 32 voices or the second set of 32 voices by pushing the bank select button. We access the cartridge voices in the same way by selecting cartridge and either the first set of 32 voices or the second set. The next voice mode is the dual mode. In the dual mode, we can play two voices with a single key. Whichever voice has the word internal or cartridge in front of it is the active voice. And we can exchange the voices the same way we select single voices. If we want to make voice B active, we do so by selecting the AB button. And now we can exchange the voices in voice B. The next mode is the split mode. In the split mode, the two voices are split left and right at middle C.
We exchange voices in the split mode, just as we do in the dual mode, by making the voice we want to change active with the AB select button, and selecting the different voices from among the 64 internal or 64 cartridge voices. The top voice in the display, voice A, is on the left side of the keyboard. The bottom voice in the display, voice B, is on the right side of the keyboard. The last mode is the performance mode. In the performance mode, we store different configurations of the first three modes. We can access either a single voice or a pair of voices dual or split, along with associated performance parameters, all of which are stored in a single patch. There are 32 performance memories in internal memory. We can access an additional 32 in a properly formatted cartridge. We access those performance memories by pressing performance and selecting one of the 32 performance memories from internal or cartridge. A performance memory can contain a single voice, a dual voice, or a split voice. Okay, campers, just to sum up, we've already learned how to access the 64 internal voices and 64 cartridge voices in the single mode. And we've seen how we can switch and reconfigure different pairs of those 64 voices in the dual and the split mode. Finally, we've seen how we can access stored pairs of those different configurations in the performance mode. Now that we know how to access individual voices in the single mode, as well as pairs of voices in the dual, split, and performance mode, let's examine how to edit an individual voice. All editing is done in this fashion. You enter the edit mode by hitting the edit button. You select the particular parameter you choose to edit, and then you change the value of that parameter using the data entry slider or the incremental switches plus and minus. As an example, let's alter the overall tuning of this string sound. We enter the edit mode and select the tuning parameter, which is button 14 under the word tune. We cycle through the menus until we reach the page which allows us to alter the particular parameter we chose, in this instance, master tuning. And having reached that page, we make sure that the cursor, which is the black square blinking in the display, is at the right parameter. If it's not, we can move it with the two cursor buttons, right or left. Once the cursor is at the particular parameter you choose to edit, you can change its value using the data entry slider or switches. For our next example, let's change the MIDI channels. Keep in mind that if you're already in an edit mode, you don't need to hit the edit button again. All you need to do is access a different parameter, in this case, MIDI switch number one. The display shows 
the transmit channel and the two receive channels as well as the MIDI mode, in this case Omni off. Again, keep in mind that a good number of these displays have multiple pages and if you are not on the right page you won't edit the right parameter. So cycle through the pages to reach the correct one and use the cursor so that the cursor is directly in front of the parameter you're trying to edit. Because the DX7 is a dual timbre synthesizer, it has the ability to receive on two independent MIDI channels. It will only send on one, that is, any one of the 16 MIDI channels. Let me insert this one note of warning. If your synthesizer is part of a MIDI setup and you have data going out and back into the synthesizer, make sure that you're not sending and receiving on the, cha on the same channels or you may defeat the split mode. So let us change the transmit channel, the channel that we're sending on, to three. We can do it either with the plus or minus incremental data switches or the fader. For our next editing example, let's change the relative volumes, that is the balance, between two voices in a dual mode. Now an important rule that you need to be aware of here is that when you're changing voice modes from an edit mode, you need to exit the edit mode by hitting the same voice mode you were in when you entered that edit mode. So I'm editing in the single mode. In order to get out of the single mode, I can't hit the dual mode or the split mode. I need to first hit the single mode again to get back into it, and then hit the dual mode. Now that I'm in the dual mode, let's change the balance between the strings and the guitar pick. We do it the same way. We enter the edit mode. We select the correct parameter. In this case, it's the voice mode. And we move the cursor to the parameter we're choosing to edit. In this instance, the balance. Right now, you see that the balance is set at zero. The levels are equal between the two voices. As I change the balance, you will hear the voices change as well. This feature enables you to set the relative level of those two voices and then store it in a performance patch. In a little while we'll see how to store all these settings. The next thing I want to do is show you how to store an individual patch. Let's try selecting a patch in internal voice number one and then saving it to internal voice number 32. First we'll select the patch. Before we actually store the voice, we have to decide which memory it will wind up in, either internal or cartridge. If the display already reads internal and we're going to internal, there's no need to change it. But if the display read cartridge and we wanted to send it to internal, we would have to first hit internal, as that is our destination. Once the destination is determined, we hold down the store button. The display reads memory protected. Before we can save a patch, we have to turn off the memory protection. And this is how we do it. We go into an edit mode, hit edit, and go to the tune function where on one of the pages we will find memory protect. 
as you'll see, the last edit we did in this parameter was the master tuning. And the synthesizer remembered that that's the last page we were on, as will all the other parameters. If we needed to, we would cycle through the pages until we reached the one we wanted to change. Finding the right page, we then use the cursor buttons to move the cursor to the parameter we're going to change. In this instance, we want to turn memory protect for internal memory off. I turn it off using the data entry button off. At this point, I need to go back into the play mode that I entered the edit mode from. That's indicated by the light over the single mode. I hit single and I'm back into the single mode play and ready to store the patch into the internal memory. We press store and hold it. The display reads store data to memory and it's asking us where we want the data stored which memory number. We press 32. 32 comes up in the display. We continue holding the store button and press yes to store the patch. The display reads completed and the patch is now in internal voice memory 32. Now let's try storing a voice from the cartridge into the internal voice memory. We'll do that by first selecting a cartridge voice. We hit cartridge and select a voice. Now because the display reads cartridge, we need to change it to internal as that is our destination. We then hold store down indicate the patch number we want it stored in and continuing to hold store we press yes the patch is now stored what used to be cartridge number four is now internal 32 as well now let's try storing an internal voice into a cartridge we can't store voices on a ROM cartridge, that is read-only memory. We need to store voices onto a RAM cartridge, that is random access memory, for reasons which I'll explain shortly. So, so let's replace the ROM with a properly formatted RAM. Before we do, let's make sure the memory protect on the cartridge itself has been turned off. We turn off the memory protect on the cartridge itself by turning this switch from on to off. Now patches can be stored onto this cartridge. Now let's replace the ROM cartridge with the RAM cartridge. Now let's select a voice which we will then store on the cartridge memory. First we choose the destination so that the display instead of internal reads cartridge. Then we hold down the store button. As you see the display tells us that the cartridge memory is memory protected on the synthesizer itself. Keep this in mind that not only do you have to turn off the cartridge memory protect on the cartridge, but you have to turn off the cartridge memory protect in the synthesizer itself. And we do that just as we did the internal memory protect. We go into the edit mode. We move the cursor to cartridge memory protect. And we turn off the cartridge memory protect. We go back into play mode by hitting single. And now we're ready to store the internal patch into a cartridge patch. 
We hold down store. It asks us where we want to store it. We press a patch, 32. And as we continue to hold down the store button, we press yes. Now we confirm the storage by accessing the cartridge voice number 32. Cartridge 32. The storage was successful. The procedure for storing a cartridge voice to a cartridge memory is the same. The only thing to keep in mind is to indicate the destination before you begin your storage and to make sure that the memory protect of your destination is off. Now let's see what's involved in storing performance patches. Whereas there are 64 single voices in the internal memory, there are 32 performance patches, that is, configurations of the other voice modes. Storing a performance patch is the same, essentially, as storing a single patch. First, you determine its destination, whether internal or cartridge. Let's store this warm string section to internal patch 32. The display already reads internal. If it were cartridge, we would have to change it to internal. We hold down store. Because the memory protect is off, we're able to memorize the patch. We indicate what patch we're going to, the destination, 32. And continuing to hold down the store button, we press yes. The patch is complete. And now the warm string section, which was in performance patch 1, now resides as well in performance patch 32. Just as we were able to exchange single voices from internal to cartridge and vice versa, we can exchange performance voices from the banks of 32 in internal and 32 in the cartridge. Now let's make our own performance voice. That is, select a pair of single voices and store it as a performance patch. We do that by going back into either the dual or split mode. Of course, we could store a single voice as a performance patch as well, but let's store a dual voice. The display gives us the two voices that are part of this dual patch. We can exchange the different voices by making either one of them active and selecting different voices. Right now, voice B is active because that's where the internal display is. And we can exchange those voices by selecting patches. We can make voice A active by hitting the AB button. Now voice A is active and we can exchange its voice. Let's store this configuration as a performance patch. We do that by hitting performance mode and as you see the display automatically expresses the patches that we chose in the dual mode. And now we store the pairing by holding down store, indicating its destination, and as we continue to hold the store button, pressing yes. We now have the pairing of the super bass and guitar as a single performance patch in internal memory 32. Alrighty friends, the next topic we're going to talk about is related to what we've just been doing. It's uh, mm, memory. 
As we've already discussed, the internal memory contains 64 single voices, as well as 32 performance memories, that is, configurations of one or two of those 64 voices. In addition to that, the internal memory on the DX7 can hold two microtunings as well as one system setup. And down the line, I'll explain both of those. Now let's talk about cartridge memory. There are two kinds of cartridges for the DX7 II, RAM cartridges and ROM cartridges. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. ROM stands for Read-Only Memory. You can only store information on a RAM, Random Access Memory. You cannot store information on a ROM. In other words, you cannot write onto a ROM because it's read-only memory. Here's a RAM and here's a ROM. The RAM can be configured three different ways. It can be formatted so as to store the same kind of memory as internal, that is 64 single voices, 32 performance memories, two microtunings, and one system setup. Or it can be formatted to store fractional scalings, which we'll discuss later. 64 fractional scalings corresponding to the 64 internal memory voices. Or it can be configured to store 63 micro tunings, which we'll also discuss down the line. So that's the RAM. It can store either all your voices or fractional scalings or micro tunings. The ROM comes from the factory with four banks. Each bank is the equivalent of a RAM. That is, each bank can be configured to store either 64 voices, 32 performance memories, two microtunings, and a system setup, or fractional scalings, or microtunings. The ROM that comes with your DX7 contains voice memories in bank 1 and bank 2. The two banks contain different voice memories. And you'll see in a second how we switch from bank to bank. Bank 3 contains fractional scalings, 64 fractional scalings that correspond to the 64 internal voices. Bank 4 either contains microtunings or is unformatted. The simplest way to distinguish a RAM from a ROM is that a RAM will have a memory protect switch. This is a RAM, this is a ROM. The memory protect switch is to protect the RAM, which can be written over. Let's examine how we switch banks on a ROM. First, let's check out what's in patch 33 in the cartridge memory. We hit cartridge and we select the second bank, number 33. Finger picker. We change banks by editing the cartridge parameter. We go into edit mode, access the cartridge parameter, and cycle through the pages until we get to voice and performance. The cursor is at the bank display and it reads number one. Let's change it to two. We now exit the edit mode the same way we got there by going to the voice we came from, single. And now let's access cartridge voice number 33 and see if it's the same as what we left. It started out as finger pick. Now let's hit cartridge again and 33. And in fact, the voice is different. This confirms that we've switched banks. Let's go back to the bank edit mode and examine the other parameters. Edit. We've already examined how to change banks on a ROM. Now let's see how to format a RAM cartridge. We'll remove the ROM 
and replace it with a RAM, making sure that the memory protect is off as we plan on formatting it and exchanging memories. We access the cartridge parameter as we're already in the edit mode. And we go to the voice and performance page where we will now format the cartridge. Move the cursor to format, press yes. The DX72 asks, are you sure? And you say, what, do you think I'm a dummy? And you say, yes. And it formats the cartridge. The, car the cartridge is now blank and ready to receive voice and performance information. We cycle through the parameters until we get to save and load. What we want to do now is save all the internal voices into the cartridge. We're saving to the cartridge. We press yes. It says, are you sure? You confirm by pressing yes again. And it's complete. We confirm this by accessing the play mode and selecting a voice in the cartridge memory. The procedure for sending all the voices from the cartridge memory to the internal memory is just the opposite. Instead of saving, we move the cursor to load. It asks you load without system. And what that means is, do you want to exchange all this data with or without the system setup information? System setup information is global keyboard information, such as MIDI send and receive channels, as well as PAN information and the cartridge bank number. If you want it sent without the system, in other words, if you want to exchange data without changing your MIDI setup, you confirm yes to the question, load without system. If you want the system setup information loaded along with the rest of the voices, you answer the question, no. Let's say yes. It confirms, are you sure? And now the system is loading all of the cartridge voices to the internal voices. It's a good idea to make sure you have backups of all your voices, which is why it's handy to have extra cartridges so that you don't run the risk of erasing all your memory and all the hard work you put into making those wonderful, beautiful patches. We just formatted this cartridge to accept voice information. The procedure for formatting it to accept fractional scaling or micro-tuning information is the same. You simply access the page with the appropriate parameter and format the cartridge to that parameter. If it were fractional scaling, we would simply go to this page, move the cursor, and format the cartridge to receive fractional scaling information. We'll discuss fractional scaling and microtuning when we get to those parameters. The new DX7 comes in two versions, the FD and the D. FD stands for floppy disk, D for dual. The floppy disk has a disk drive and allows you to store a vast amount of information on a floppy disk, just like this. If you don't have the FD, go out and have a cheeseburger. Or stay and watch this because you may want to get one when you understand the amount of memory that it puts at your fingertips. Here's the deal. A single floppy disk contains the equivalent of 44 cartridges. That means if you have a cartridge that contains 64 single voices, a single floppy disk will contain whatever that is. What is 44 times 64? I don't know. A lot. A lot of voices. A vast, a vast amount. amount of information. <laughs> OK? But there are some limiting parameters that you need to be aware of, mainly you cannot access the voices on the floppy disk directly. You need to first dump them either to the internal memory or to the cartridge memory. You can't press a button and call up a voice from the floppy disk. Here's how it works. Shove your floppy disk ever so gently into the disk drive. 
access the disk parameter by going into the edit mode and pressing the disk button in the utility section. If you cycle through the menus, you'll see an internal page, a cartridge page, a MIDI recorder page, MDR, and the format page. Let's first format this blank disk. That is, prepare it to receive information. Make sure the cursor is on format using the cursor buttons. Set disk and push. Yes. It asks if you're sure, and you bang on it ferociously saying, of course I'm sure. Busy, now executing. And the display will show you the tracks as it wipes them clean of whatever was there to prepare it to receive new information. Be aware that format will wipe any information you have on a disk. So only do it on new disks or on a disk whose information you don't mind losing. It takes a little while to cycle through, so you can go out and have a cup of coffee or a pickle from your refrigerator. It's still ticking. <laughs> Busy, now executing. Completed. It's finished executing some foreign dictator or the like and ready to receive information. Let's try dumping all the internal memory into a single file on the disk. In order to do that, we enter the edit mode and access the disk parameters. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that the disk will store internal memory information in its internal memory location and cartridge information in a separate cartridge memory location. That means that you can't store cartridge information in the internal memory section of the disk and vice versa. You cannot store internal memories in the cartridge memory on the disk. So in order to store internal memory information, we need to access the page that displays internal. Internal disk. Now the cursor is at the word directory and if we press yes, it will tell us if there are any files in this disk. There are none because we just formatted it recently. If there were, the directory would enable you to cycle through the names of the different files in order to identify the file you wanted to call up. Using the save function, we can save information from the internal memory onto disk. As soon as the cursor gets to save, it asks the question, input file name. At this point, you need to name the file that you're going to store onto the disk. We do that by holding down the edit button, which also says character, and spelling out the name of the file. Let's call this file new file. We spell the word new file using the voice keys, which are now doubling as alphabet keys. Numbers and letters are under the voices. N, E, W. If we wanted to use capital letters, we would change from lowercase to uppercase using the internal or cartridge keys. Capital F, I, L, E. If I made a mistake, I could go back using the cursor keys. 
and changing the number or letter. If I wanted to insert a space, I would press the key for space. One thing to keep in mind is that certain names will not be accepted by the disk. For example, if I were to write new dot 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 and try and save that by pressing yes, it would give me a display saying bad file name. I would have to then reaccess the parameter and write a good file name. Generally all letters will do. And E W F I L A. Now by pressing yes, it will store all the internal memory in a file on disk, now referred to as new file. As you see, if I cycle through directory, file number one is new file. Two is now empty. We could, if we chose to, now reload the voices that are on disk back into the internal memory. We would do that by moving the cursor to the word load. The file that is on display is the file that will be loaded. And it asks the question, load without system. Let's load the voices with the system setup by answering no. It says, are you sure? And you say, yes. Now executing. The system is now loading all the voices from file one of the disk into the internal memory. We could delete the file on disk with the next parameter, which is delete. It says delete new file, and you say yes. Are you sure? Yes or no. Be careful because it's now erased all the information that was stored under the name new file in file one. The last parameter on this page is rename. If we chose to rename the original file to another file name, we would simply access the rename parameter, hold down the character button, which is also the edit button, and punch in the new name. Confirm. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Now the original name of the file, new file, is now referred to as new name. On the disk internal page, we can load and save information back and forth between the internal memory and the disk memory. The same is true of the cartridge disk memory. Just as with the disk internal page, you have a directory, you can save, load, delete, rename. And also, you can determine the bank of the particular cartridge. Because, as we've discovered, ROM cartridges are capable of containing more than one bank. The format page of the disk parameter, in addition to format, allows you to back up a disk. In order to back up information on the disk, you simply respond to the questions and directions on the display. It will ask you if you're sure, and then instruct you when to insert the new disk and when to insert the old disk. You will have to do this numerous times in order to copy all the information from one disk to the other. In order to find out how much memory is left on your disk, access the free byte parameter. It'll tell you the number of bytes that are available and express that as the number of internal and cartridge files that are available, in this case 42. Remember, the disk stores internal memory in its internal memory location and cartridge memory in its cartridge memory location. 
And the result is that you can't load cartridge memory from the disk to the internal memory of the synthesizer. You can only load cartridge to cartridge or internal to internal. The only way you can get cartridge memory from off of a disk into the internal memory is to first load it into a cartridge and then load it from cartridge to the internal memory. All righty, campers. So far, we've examined how to access the different play modes and how to manage our memory. We've done a little bit of editing. What I'd like to do now is go right into FM synthesis and examine how to edit an individual voice from scratch. All righty, here's the story. In the early 1970s, John Chowning was fooling around with two sine waves. And what he discovered was that if you took one sine wave and modulated it with another sine wave, the result was a complex waveform, rich in harmonics and very useful for making sounds. That's FM synthesis. One sine wave modulating another sine wave. The sine wave that does the modulating is called the modulator. The sine wave that is being modulated is called the carrier. You only actually hear the carrier. Its output is sent to the speaker. You don't hear the modulator. You only hear its effect on the carrier. Yamaha refers to each of these sine waves as an operator. And instead of offering just two operators, they give us six. In addition to that, they've given us 32 configurations of those six operators in what they call algorithms. And if you look at the panel of the DX7, you'll see the 32 algorithms displayed. By examining the algorithm displays, it's possible to determine which operators are carriers and which operators are modulators. The carriers are those operators in the lowest row of the algorithm. On algorithm number one, the carriers would be operator one and operator three. The modulators would be two, four, five, and six. Remember, the carrier is heard directly. The modulator is not. You only hear the effect of the modulator on the carrier. What I want to do now is initialize a voice. That is, start from scratch with a single operator and see how we can affect it using a modulator. The DX7 provides the ability to do just that, start from scratch, with its voice initialize function. We access it by going into the edit mode and pressing the tune button, number 14, which contains voice initialize. We cycle through the pages of the tune parameter until we see initialize. We can initialize voice A or voice B independently or a performance patch. Let's initialize a single voice A. Are you sure? Yes. What we hear now on the keyboard is a single unadulterated sine wave. When designing an FM voice, there are basically three parameters that we can alter. We can change the frequency of the operator, we can change its overall level, and we can design an envelope shape for that level. Let's first examine the output level function, which enables us to change the overall level of the operator. We can alter the output level of an operator by entering the output level parameter, which is number 10. As with many of these functions, there are multiple pages. We cycle through the page until we reach the output level parameter, which as we see now, according to where the cursor is, is at 99, the maximum level. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, of the display, you'll see the words OP1. That stands for Operator 1. Operator 1 in Algorithm 1 is the operator that is now active. We can change the level with the data entry fader. And the result is this.
An important rule to remember about operators is they have to be up, that is their output level has to be up, and they have to be on. By on, it means that they have to be active. The six ones in the display represent the six operators and whether they're on or off. We turn the operators on and off using the operator on off buttons, one through six. When an operator is off, a zero is displayed. Again, in order for an operator to be heard, it needs to be both on and up. In order to change another operator, we need to select another operator and thereby change the display in the upper left hand corner. We select operators using the operator select buttons. By selecting two, it displays the output level of operator two, which as you can see is at zero. Let's see what happens as we raise the output level of operator two. Remember, operator two is a modulator modulating operator one, which is a carrier. That is FM synthesis, one sine wave modulating another. Essentially, the result is the sound gets brighter as more harmonics become part of the waveform. Remember, in order for an operator to be heard, or its effect to be heard, it needs to be both on and up. If we were to turn operator 2 off using the operator on off switches, then even though its level was at 99, it would not be affecting operator 1. We've examined how changing the output level of an operator affects the overall sound. If you change the output level of a carrier, the sound gets louder or softer. If you change the output level of a modulator, the sound gets brighter or duller. Now let's examine what happens when you change the frequency of an operator. Let's turn off operator two using the operator on off switch. And let's listen to operator one as we change its frequency. First, select operator one. And now let's select the oscillator parameter in order to change the frequency. The oscillator display includes the parameters for coarse and fine tuning. Let's change the coarse tuning of the sound and listen to what it does. As you see, changing the coarse frequency alters the pitch of the note in whole number multiples of the original pitch. What that means is one, two times, three times, four times, five times the original frequency. This relationship happens to be the same as the natural harmonic series. We can also alter the fine frequency, moving the cursor to the fine parameter. As you see, the fine frequency control simply changes the frequency in smaller increments. Let's see what happens when we alter the frequency not of the carrier, but of the modulator. In order to do that, we need to turn operator 2 on. Operator 2 is the modulator. And in order to change the parameter for operator 2, we need to see it displayed in the upper left-hand corner 
And we do that by selecting it at the operator select button number two. Let's go to the course frequency control and listen to what happens to the sound as we alter the frequency of the modulator. The difference here is that when you change the frequency of a carrier by itself, you change the overall pitch of the sound. However, when you change the frequency of a modulator, which is modulating a carrier, the result is that you change the timbre of the sound. Let's hear what happens when we change the fine frequency of the modulator. Move the cursor to fine. As you can see, the fine-tuning produces more and more dissonant harmonics in the sound. However, just because the sound is dissonant, there's no need to dismiss it. Keep in mind that in the right amounts, even the most abrasive timbre can be very useful. There is one other parameter in the oscillator section that enables you to alter frequency, and that is detune. Detuning is an even finer version of fine-tuning and enables you to very slightly alter the pitch between individual oscillators. Its range is plus or minus 7. The last parameter in the oscillator section is mode. There are two modes, ratio or fixed. Let's examine operator one all by itself in order to determine the difference. Turn off two, select one. Move the cursor to the mode parameter. In the ratio mode, the frequency of a note will change according to where you play on the keyboard. In the fixed mode, however, the frequency of the note remains the same regardless of where you play it. The reason you don't hear the note is because if you look at the Hertz display, the frequency of this pitch is below the audible frequency range. We can raise that simply by going to the course frequency. As you see, every note I play will output a frequency of 100 hertz. I raise it again and it'll go to 1000. Similarly, I can alter the fine tuning and it, like the course tuning, will remain constant across the length of the keyboard. The reason for offering a fixed mode is for instances where, for example, you may want to include a portion of a sound that remains constant, like the picky portion of a guitar. Let's throw in all the other operators and see what happens to the sound. We hit our output level, and we select operator 3, and raise the level. Let's do the same with the other operators. We select operator 4 and raise its level. We do the same with 5. And six. As you can see, as we increase the modulation in the sound, the timbre becomes brighter and brighter until it approaches noise. One thing to remember is that if you 
interrupt the chain of modulators. You interrupt the modulation. For example, if I were to remove operator 4 from the stack of operators, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 6 and 5 would no longer modulate 3. The chain needs to be continuous. In this instance, 6 is modulating 5, which is modulating 4, which is modulating 3. It is possible to change algorithms and yet retain the settings for each of the six operators. We do that by accessing the algorithm parameter, number 7. The cursor is on algorithm, which displays the number 1. We can change algorithms by simply changing the value. Notice how dramatically the sound changes according to how the operators are reconfigured. The next function in the algorithm section is the feedback level. If you examine the algorithms, you'll notice that each algorithm contains at least one operator, and sometimes as many as three, with a loop around it. This operator is the feedback operator. And essentially, it is designed to modulate itself. Listen to what happens in algorithm 4 as I increase the feedback level. First, I go to algorithm 4, and then I change the feedback level. As you can see, by raising the feedback level to its maximum setting, you can achieve the equivalent of white noise, something useful for percussive sounds and for attacks and the like. In more moderate amounts, it's very useful, for example, in creating the bright, brassy quality of a trumpet. The next parameter in the algorithm section is oscillator sync, which can be either on or off. Oscillator sync controls the phase with which the sine wave is triggered when you play a note. If oscillator sync is on, then every time you play a note, it will be triggered in exactly the same way, starting at exactly the same place. If oscillator sync is off, then each note played will trigger slightly differently, as the note will start in a different phase of the sine wave. A good example is the string bass sound in internal voice number 27. We exit the edit mode and select internal 27. If we go back into the edit mode, we can see that the oscillator sync is off. If you listen carefully, you will hear the difference. When it's off, the notes trigger slightly differently at the attack. When it's on, they're identical. Off. On. As you can see, when oscillator sync is on, the attack is consistent. When it's off, it is altered from note to note. The next parameter in the algorithm section is transpose. It's pretty self-explanatory. There are two ways to change the transposition of a keyboard. One is by the data entry method. The other is directly by the keyboard. The first key that you play after entering the transpose parameter will determine the new transposed pitch. Right now, middle C is C3. If I play an F, middle C will now be F. 
The other way of changing the value is as usual with the data entry slider or buttons. The next parameter in the algorithm section is voice name. We've already experienced naming voices when we made a file on our disk. It is accomplished in exactly the same fashion. We access the parameter, and as you see, a cursor is over the first letter. If we were to rename this now edited patch, we would hold down the character button and key in the letters or numbers to identify the new patch. Again, upper and lower case can be changed using the internal or cartridge key. Space. Cut it. The new name for this voice must be stored as part of the voice itself. And that's done just as we stored voices earlier on. For example, if we were to store this space patch in its original location, we would go back to play mode, hold down store, press 27, Continue to hold store and press yes. Now as you see, 27 has a new name. What we're going to do now is examine the EG, that is envelope generator, which enables us to design the overall shape of each individual operator. First let's initialize the voice once more so that we can start from scratch with a single operator. Go into edit, find voice initialize, yes. This leaves us with a single operator, algorithm one. Now let's access the envelope generator. The display you're looking at contains nine values. The first value is rate scaling. And let's leave that aside for a moment and discuss the other eight. The following eight values are rates and levels. The envelope generator on the DX7 has four rates and four levels. One way to think of it is almost like a circus tent, where the poles of the tent represent the levels of output for the individual operator. Just to give an example of how these rates and levels interact, let's slow down rate 1, which will have the effect of softening the attack. But before we can change rate 1, we have to confirm that the current operator is the one we want to change. On the upper left-hand corner of the display, it says operator 6. We want to change operator 1 because, as we know from past experience, the default setting for voice initialize only leaves operator 1 up. So let's change operator 6 to operator 1 and now slow down rate 1. You can see easily how rate 1 is responsible for slowing down the attack. Let's do the same to rate 4. That is, the speed with which the envelope goes from level 3 to level 4. When rate 4 is at 99, the note disappears as soon as I release my finger. When rate 4 
is a little lower setting, the note takes a longer while to die out. One important thing to be aware of as far as the envelope generator is that level three is the sustain level. Level three is the level that the operator will remain at for as long as you hold the key down. Knowing that, let's see what happens when we take level three and change its value from 99 to zero. Move the cursor to level three and lower its value. As you see, the envelope is going through its attack portion, that is the slow part of rate one. And as soon as it reaches level three, it disappears because level three is set at zero. Let's see what happens if we put rate one back at 99 for an immediate attack. The result is a short but discernible click as you strike the key. What's happening is the note is going instantly to 99 and instantly back down to zero, which is the sustain level, level three. Now let's go to rate three, which is the speed at which the envelope goes to zero, and slow that down to see how it changes the sound. By spending some time manipulating the rates and levels of the envelope, you'll soon become familiar with how to design the shape of an operator. Keep in mind this fundamental principle. When you're changing the level of a carrier, you're changing its volume. When you're changing the level of a modulator, you're changing its timbre, that is, its brightness, its harmonic content. This rule holds true as regards the envelope generator. When you're designing an envelope generator for a carrier, you're designing a volume envelope. And when you're designing an envelope generator for a modulator, you're designing a timbre envelope or a harmonic envelope. Another important thing to keep in mind regarding the envelope generator is the value for level four. In most instances, in the carrier, level four will be at zero, as level four is the point from which the envelope begins and ends. If level four is more than zero, the note will sound like this. reason, a basic principle is that in carriers, level four must be at zero. However, there are instances in a modulator where you may want level four at more than zero. This is useful for creating harmonic sweeps that start bright and end bright. Let's design a simple envelope for a modulator. In order to do that, we need to turn the output level of operator two up. Access the output level parameter, select operator two, we hear its effect as a modulator. Now let's go back to the envelope generator section. Let's put back the sustain in operator one. In order to do that, we go to level three, which is the sustain level. Now, 
Now let's go to operator two and design an envelope for the modulator whose shape is different than the carrier. We select operator two. Let's slow down rate one and see how that affects the envelope of the modulator. The important thing to keep in mind here is the difference between designing envelopes for the modulator as opposed to the carrier. The modulator creates harmonic shapes. The carrier creates volume shapes. Let's design one more envelope just to demonstrate the flexibility of this four-stage envelope generator. We're going to design an envelope that has a double attack. In order to design an envelope with a double attack, we want the level to go up, down, and up again, and finally down. So thinking of our levels as the poles in the circus tent, let's design a shape where the levels go 99, down to 0, back up to 99, and back down to 0. Let's listen to the note. Now we're not hearing the ascent and the descent, but there is a discernible click in the beginning of the note. In fact, what's happening is the level is going up, down, and up, and down, but it's going so quickly that it's being expressed as a percussive click. We can make the ascent and the descent discernible by slowing down the rates. Remember, rate one goes to level one, rate two goes to level two, rate three goes to level three. Let's set all the rates at 60 to more clearly hear the shape of this envelope. As you can see, we've designed a double attack. There's one other feature of envelope generators, which we'll discuss right now, and that is EG copy. Say, for example, you've designed a very complex envelope for operator one, and you want to design the identical envelope for operator two. One way to do it would be simply to go to operator two and set the exact levels as you did for operator one. The DX7 provides a simpler way to do the same thing, and it's called EG copy. EG copy works in this way. You start with the envelope that you want to copy from, in this instance, operator one. And then, in the edit mode, which we're in, you hold down the store button. The display reads, e.g. in scaling copy, operator 1 to operator, and now we select 2. What we've done is made an exact copy of the envelope generator, which is on 1, to operator 2. Let's confirm that by looking at operator 2's envelope generator. And in fact, it is an exact copy of what was on 1. EG is a fast and easy way of duplicating envelope generators without having to dial in each individual value. The last parameter in the envelope generator section is rate scaling, which is the first value in the display. Rate scaling enables you to taper the keyboard so that the higher you go on the keyboard, the shorter the envelope becomes. A good example of this is the internal voice number 13, marimba. Let's take a look at it. The higher you play on the keyboard, the shorter the envelope becomes. This is a characteristic of acoustic instruments that is emulated with the rate scaling feature. Let's just examine 
the rate scaling levels of this voice to confirm that fact. Go into the edit mode. Access the envelope generator. And sure enough, the rate scaling value for each operator is more than zero. Listen to what happens to the sound if I take the rate scale values down to zero. As you can see, the higher the rate scaling on a particular operator, the faster the envelope will cycle. In other words, the shorter the notes on the top portion of the keyboard. So far, we've examined the first three parameters in the voice edit section. We've looked at the algorithm section, we've looked at the oscillator section, and we just looked at the envelope generator section. Let's now go and look at the rest of the output level parameter. We've already examined how to change the output level in the output level parameter. And now let's look at the other parameters. There, there are two pages in the output level parameter. The page we're looking at now contains the level which we've already changed. And five other parameters which have to do with keyboard scaling. These parameters are left to right, the left depth, the left curve, the break point, the right curve, and the right depth. Keyboard scaling is a parameter that provides you with the means to control the output level of an operator relative to where you play on the keyboard. For example, I could set the keyboard scaling for operator 1 so that the higher I played on the keyboard, the softer it would become. Here's a simple example of that. This feature gives us the ability to design timbres that change as acoustic instruments change across the length of the keyboard. This is how it works. If you examine the graphic for the keyboard level scaling in the upper right corner of your synthesizer, you'll see curves left and right of a breakpoint. These curves represent the direction in which the output level changes and whether it increases or decreases relative to the breakpoint. A plus curve will increase the output level away from the breakpoint, and a minus curve will decrease the output level away from the breakpoint. There are two kinds of curves, linear and exponential. Linear increases or decreases the output level at a constant rate, whereas exponential increases or decreases more gradually at the start and more suddenly towards the end of its curve. When assigning keyboard scaling to a particular operator, we have to make five choices. The first choice is the break point. We select at what point on the keyboard do we want to start the curve. We set the break point by moving the cursor to that parameter and changing the note number with the data entry fader. It is possible to make a breakpoint that is not actually on the keyboard itself. For now, let's set a breakpoint of middle C. The next choice you make is the type of curve to the right and to the left of the breakpoint. For our example, we chose a negative linear curve so that the sound would decrease as it moved away from the breakpoint in a linear fashion.
if we had selected a positive linear curve, the output level would increase as it moved away from the breakpoint. One important thing to keep in mind is that if your output level is already at maximum, there will be no headroom in order for the operator's level to increase. So in order to experience an increase with a positive linear curve, we need to first lower the output level. Having selected a curve, we dial in its amount with the left and right depths. The right depth was already set at 99. Let's set the left depth at 99 as well. A negative linear curve with a depth of 99 will cause this operator's level to decrease as we move away from the breakpoint. A typical use of keyboard scaling would be an instance where you've designed a sound that sounds great in the middle of the keyboard but starts becoming abrasive as you play the higher notes. Another example of keyboard scaling would be designing a patch with a percussive attack in the upper register that did not exist in the lower register. Let's examine the marimba to see how keyboard scaling is used on operator 6. As you can see, the left depth for operator 6 is at 42. The curve is negative linear. Let's hear what happens when we remove the left depth and therefore neutralize the scaling. As you see, without level scaling, the percussive attack is very prominent in the lower register, more than we would like. However, with keyboard scaling, the percussive attack, which comes from operator 6, is minimized, but retained in the upper register. Da -da. Most people are a little intimidated by level scaling. The reason is, is because it's operator specific and has five parameters for each operator. Which means that if you want to change the level scaling for a particular timbre, you have to change 30 parameters. This can be a big pain, but it is important to be able to understand how to use it when the need arises. The new DX7 offers an enhanced version of level scaling which gives you output level control across the keyboard every three notes. It's called fractional scaling. Let's look at it. We access fractional scaling by going to the next page on the output level and changing the scaling mode from normal to fractional. Now that we're in fractional mode, we can change the menu once again by hitting the output level button and we get this display. The first parameter is the offset level, which is at zero, and it represents overall control of the output level for each particular operator. The next value, as we move the cursor, is a note number that represents a three note range on the keyboard. To the right of that note number is another note number, C sharp, which represents the three note range to the right of the original three note range. The numbers below the note numbers represent the maximum output level for each three note range. We can change the current range in two ways. We can do it directly from the keyboard by pressing a key and hitting either the internal or cartridge buttons. 
The other way of changing the current range is with the internal cartridge buttons, which are now doubling as fractional key sets. The three note ranges are fixed ranges whose output level we can change by changing the number below the note range. Let's change the output level of the range that begins at C sharp 3. As you see, the display gives us the three note range to the left and to the right, as well as the current three note range. Controlling the level of the output within a three note range, as we do in fractional level scaling, obeys the same rules for operators whenever we control level. And that is that changing the level of a carrier changes its volume. Changing the level of a modulator changes its timbre. Let's examine internal voice number 23, multi-percussion, to see how fractional scaling is employed to make the most out of a single patch. As you can see, each of the three note ranges in this patch has a different fractional level scaling. Now here's something important that you need to understand. Fractional scaling cannot be stored in the synthesizer itself. It only exists on an adjacent cartridge. That is, it is possible to store 64 fractional scalings that correspond to 64 internal voices. Another thing you need to be aware of is that when you call up a patch that contains fractional scaling, the display will do this. a small f before the voice number, which represents fractional scaling, will appear if there is no corresponding cartridge containing the fractional scaling information. This simply tells you that this patch ought to have its corresponding fractional scaling information. If we insert the appropriate cartridge, which contains the fractional scaling information, that corresponds to each patch, and then reselect the patch, the fractional scaling reminder disappears. This is also true for micro tunings, which we will discuss later on. So far, we've examined the first four parameters in the voice edit section. Let's take a look at sensitivity. The first parameter in the sensitivity section is velocity, key velocity. Key velocity is a feature by which level is controlled by how quickly you strike a key. If we turn the key velocity to its maximum setting, you'll see that if I strike the key slowly, it's soft. If I strike the key, suddenly, it's loud. This parameter is operator specific, which means that you need to set it for each individual operator. Again, the same rules apply. When you're controlling output level of a carrier, you're dealing in volume. When you're controlling output level of a modulator, you're dealing in brightness or timbre. Let's set the velocity sensitivity for operator 1 back to 0 and change it for operator 2. 
which is the modulator. Changing level on a carrier controls volume. Changing level on a modulator controls brightness. The next two parameters are amplitude modulation sensitivity and pitch modulation sensitivity. In order to explain the function of these two parameters, let's first discuss the LFO. The LFO wiggles your note. A fancier term for that is it modulates some aspect of the sound. And depending on which aspect of the sound it is assigned to, will determine the effect. If you control the pitch of a sound with the LFO, you achieve frequency modulation, or vibrato. If you control amplitude modulation of a sound, the basic rule for operators and level applies. That is, controlling the amplitude of a carrier gives you amplitude modulation or tremolo. Controlling the amplitude of a modulator gives you harmonic modulation, almost analogous to filter modulation on an analog synthesizer. The basic rule of the LFO is that you must both send and receive the information in order for it to be operative. That is, you need to send the amount of the LFO as well as prime the operators for receiving LFO modulation. We prime the operators in the sensitivity section. First, let's turn up the pitch modulation sensitivity. As you see in parentheses, it says all operators. What this means is that when you modulate the pitch of a sound, you modulate all the operators at the same time. Pitch modulation is not operator specific. Having set the operators to receive modulation, let's go back to the LFO and send modulation. The pitch modulation depth is where we send modulation directly from the keyboard. Amplitude modulation works in much the same way. The difference is that when you set the sensitivity for amplitude modulation, it is operator specific, and you must set it for each individual operator. Let's first set it for operator one, which is our carrier. It's set to receive, and now we must send it from the LFO. That's amplitude modulation in a carrier. Now let's examine the other parameters of the LFO. In order to do that, let's add a little pitch modulation. Let's first turn off the amplitude modulation and set the pitch modulation sensitivity. We return to the LFO and set the pitch modulation depth, that is, the LFO that's being sent from the keyboard. <laughs> Let's slow down the speed. We go to the speed parameter and change the value. <laughs> the 
The next parameter is wave select. You can select from among a triangle wave, a sawtooth down, a sawtooth up, a square wave, and a sine wave. The last waveform available is the sample and hold, or random waveform. Delay enables you to delay the point at which the LFO kicks in. Instead of having LFO as soon as you strike a key, it gives you an opportunity to sound the note without LFO for a short period of time. We increase the amount of delay. The next parameter in the LFO is the mode select. The LFO mode can be single or multi. In the single mode, when you play two notes, the LFO controls them simultaneously. In the multi mode, the LFO controls the notes independently, so that if you were to play one after the other, they would not be synchronized. The last parameter in the LFO is sync. When sync is on, the direction of the LFO is constant every time you play a key. When sync is off, the direction of the LFO is random. Instead of sending LFO directly from the keyboard, we can turn it off in the LFO section and send the amount of LFO from one of the performance controllers such as the mod wheel. which stands for Envelope Generator Bias.
We can control the amount of LFO as we did with the modulation wheel from after touch or the breath controller or a foot pedal. Later on, we shall examine other sorts of performance control parameters. For now, just keep in mind the concept that in order to experience LFO, you need to both send and receive the information. The next parameter we're going to examine is the pitch envelope generator, pitch EG. The pitch envelope generator is built along the same lines as your basic envelope generator. It has four rates and four levels. The main thing to keep in mind about the pitch envelope is that its neutral setting for levels is at 50. So for example, if we were to lower one of the levels and slow down the rate going from that level to the next, we would achieve a pitch bend. Let's lower level one. And now let's slow down rate two, which controls the time it takes for level one to get to level two. Just as it's possible to design complex volume and harmonic envelopes with the main envelope generator, it's possible to design complex pitch envelopes with the pitch envelope generator. It is global, which means it controls all six operators at once. There are three other parameters in the pitch envelope generator. The first is range which controls the range of the pitch bend. Eight octaves is the maximum range. Altering the range enables you to tailor the depth of the pitch bend. The next parameter is velocity. With velocity on, the pitch bend range becomes a function of how quickly you strike the key. Strike it slowly, and you have a minimum of pitch bend. Strike it quickly, and you hear your pitch bend. The next parameter is rate scaling, similar to the rate scaling found in the main envelope generator. In the pitch envelope generator, when you increase the amount of rate scaling, then as you ascend in the keyboard, the speed of the envelope increases. There are two features on the DX that enable you to retrieve information from memory. One of them is Edit Compare, the other is Edit Recall. In addition to its normal memory, the DX has two temporary buffers. These temporary buffers store voice information so that it can be retrieved as needed. First, let's discuss Edit Compare. As an example, let's try editing this warm string sound. We'll change the algorithm. We enter the edit mode, select Algorithm, and let's change it from 15 to 10. Notice that the very first time you edit a parameter of a voice, a dot will appear in the LED immediately after the voice number. Let's change the algorithm to 10. Clearly, this is an edited version of a warm string sound. 
At this point, if we wanted to compare the edited string with the original string, all we need do is press the Edit Compare button. The voice number begins flashing, which tells you you're listening to the original voice. It's possible to toggle back and forth between the original and the edited. The original and the edited. Now let's say we got bored editing that warm string sound and decided to experiment with some other voices. But after much thought and consideration, we finally decided that the last string edit that we did is really what we're looking for. But have we lost it? No. That's where we go to Edit Recall. In order to retrieve the very last edit, we enter the Edit Recall mode. We enter the Edit mode, access Recall Edit, which is under the Tune function in the Utility section, and say yes to Voice Recall Edit. It says, are you sure? You think about it for a second. And then you say, yeah, I'm sure. And finally, indubitably, the warm string sound edited is called to the keyboard. Recall Edit can also be used to recall the last edited performance memory, as well as the last edited microtuning. We've already discussed how to format a cartridge for voice and performances, and how to access its different banks, as well as how to save and load. The other parameters on this page have to do with formatting a cartridge to receive fractional scalings or microtunings. The routine for this is identical to the routine for formatting a voice and performance cartridge. Likewise, we have already discussed formatting a disk to receive internal information as well as cartridge information. This last page, as we mentioned earlier, enables you to receive MIDI data information. Let's now examine the four different key modes. The new DX is a 16 voice duo timbre synthesizer. Duo timbre means that you can access two sounds from the same instrument simultaneously. 16 voiced means that is the total number of keys that can be played at once in single mode, which is more than enough unless you happen to live next door to a leaky nuclear reactor and have more than five fingers on each hand. Let's examine the four key modes. There are four key modes. They are polyphonic, monophonic, unison poly, and unison mono. In polyphonic mode, you can play all 16 voices at once in the single play mode. In the monophonic mode, no matter how many keys you hold down, only one will sound. This is for certain kinds of solo playing. An important feature of the monophonic mode is that how a note is triggered is dependent on how you articulate the note. For example, if you play staccato, in other words, lift your finger off after playing each note, the envelope of the note will re-trigger from the very beginning. However, if you play legato, which is 
play the second note before you've lifted off the first note. The second note does not re-trigger its envelope. It shares the envelope with the first note. This is an effective means of articulating phrases according to how you play. The unison poly mode is similar to the polyphonic mode, except it offers half the number of voices, as there are two voices per key in order to give you the ability to detune the voices. The last mode, unison mono, also offers the ability to detune a monophonic voice. As with the normal mono mode, how you articulate your playing determines whether or not the envelopes will re-trigger. When the poly mono button is unlit, then the parameters in the voice mode are as displayed. However, when the poly mono button is lit, the actual keyboard mode is in fact the opposite of whatever parameter is displayed in the key mode. For example, if the monophonic mode is displayed with the poly mono button key lit, in fact, the keyboard will be polyphonic and vice versa. If polyphonic is displayed, the keyboard will in fact be monophonic. Let's talk about pitch bend. The most important parameter in pitch bend is range. Range is displayed in increments of a half step. If the range is at zero, there will be no pitch bend. If range is at one, it will pitch bend up or down half a step. There is a maximum of an octave, up or down. The next parameter is step, which enables you to determine whether the pitch bend will be continuous or in increments. There are four pitch bend modes. In the normal mode, all notes played bend. In the low mode, only the lowest note will bend. In the high mode, only the highest note will bend. Finally, in the key on mode, only keys that are actually being depressed will bend. Notes that are sounding due to a long release in the envelope or notes that are being sustained with the sustain pedal 
will not bend. Sustain. Only the note held down is bent. Portamento is a feature which causes the frequency of a note to glide to the frequency of the next note. The most important parameter in portamento is time. The time can be very slow or very quick. The next parameter is step. Just as in pitch bend, it enables you to control the increments of the slide. There are four portamento modes. Two of them are polyphonic, and two of them are monophonic. Let's first examine the polyphonic modes. The first polyphonic portamento mode is sustain key pitch retain, which means that any keys sustained will not experience portamento. Their pitches will be retained. You still hear the sustained frequencies. The second polyphonic mode is sustain key pitch follow. In this mode, even frequencies that are sustained will receive portamento. In order to examine the two monophonic modes, we must first turn the key mode to monophonic. We access the key mode parameter and change it to monophonic. We go back to portamento and we see two monophonic portamento modes, full time and fingered. In the full time mode, portamento is active regardless of how you articulate the notes. Legato or staccato. In the fingered mode, how you play the notes determines whether or not portamento is active. If you play staccato, there will be no portamento. If you play legato, Portamento is active. The last page of the Pitch Bend Portamento menu is Random Pitch. By introducing random pitch into a sound, we achieve a slightly altered frequency every time we play the note. This effect is useful for emulating certain acoustic instruments whose frequency is never as precise and dead on as a synthesizer's. A good example would be a string bass patch or the steel cans in internal voice number 28. How you doing, folks? Let's take a peek at some of our performance controllers the modulation wheel, aftertouch, and the breath controller. We've already looked at the modulation wheel when discussing the LFO and sensitivity. With the appropriate operators set to receive modulation, we can send the amount of the modulation from the modulation wheel by increasing 
the range. For pitch modulation, or amplitude modulation, or EG bias. All these things hold true for aftertouch and breath control as well. We can achieve pitch modulation. By pressing down on the key. Or amplitude modulation. By pressing down on the key. Or EG bias. An additional parameter of aftertouch is pitch bias, which enables you to bend the pitch of the note up or down according to its range. <laughs> The breath controller can control the same parameters as the modulation wheel and aftertouch. We can control pitch modulation. <laughs> amplitude modulation. <laughs> E.g. bias. and pitch bias. Note the number in parentheses in the bottom left of your display under the name of the breath controller and the modulation wheel. This number is the MIDI control number that accesses those parameters. Next, let's take a look at foot controllers 1 and 2. Foot controller 1 has many of the parameters that the modulation wheel after touch and breath controller have. You can control pitch modulation. <laughs> You can control amplitude modulation. You can control EG bias. And you can control overall volume. One other parameter of the foot control is CS1. What that means is by turning CS1 on, you can assign the foot controller to control whatever parameter CS1 is controlling. CS1, the continuous slider, can be set to control any voice parameter, as we'll shortly see. So for example, in this instance, I have CS1 set to control the course frequency of operator 3. Keep in mind that the effect of the continuous slider can only be heard in the play mode, not the edit mode. So in order to confirm, we need to go out of the edit mode into a play mode.
Foot controller number two controls the same parameters with the exception of being able to control a continuous slider. This page enables you to assign an external MIDI device so that it can control the same parameters as the modulation wheel and foot controllers. The number in brackets is assignable and can be changed on a menu in the MIDI section. That concludes our discussion of the voice parameters. Now let's go on and discuss the performance parameters. But first, let me make a critical point. It's very important to keep in mind the distinction between voice parameters and performance parameters for this reason. Never try to edit voice parameters in the performance edit mode and vice versa. Never try to edit performance parameters in the voice edit mode. If you do, you will see the changes on the display and you will hear the changes in the sound, but you will not be able to store those changes when you store the patch. You can only store voice parameters from a voice edit mode and you can only store performance parameters from a performance edit mode. The different parameters are clearly depicted on the front panel under the voice or performance headings. Let's go on and discuss the continuous sliders and foot switches. Continuous slider number one, as we've seen, is capable of controlling all voice parameters in addition to total volume. We select these parameters by putting the cursor on select and stepping through the different parameters. In order to achieve continuous slider control over voice A and or B, we need to turn them on. Again, it's very important to keep in mind that continuous slider control of these parameters will not be heard in the edit mode. You must return to a play mode. Let's listen as we control the course frequency of operator one. <laughs> Note the number in brackets in the bottom left hand corner of the display. This is the MIDI controller channel number and enables the continuous slider to be controlled from an external MIDI device. The number is assigned on the MIDI page. Continuous slider number two affects the same parameters as does number one. The next page is the sustain foot switch. In order to achieve sustain on voice A and or voice B, you need to turn them on. It's possible to have only one of the voices sustain and the other not. As you can hear, the bell does not sustain. If I turn the sustain on for voice B, it will. The foot switch is essentially identical to the sustain pedal. In fact, you can use the sustain pedal and simply plug it into the foot switch port. The difference is that you can select different parameters for it to affect. It can act as a sustain pedal.
It can also control portamento. The key hold parameter will sustain whatever key is held down before you depress the foot switch, enabling you to play other notes above it without their being sustained. The soft mode enables the foot switch to function as does the soft pedal on a piano. In order for it to operate, you need to introduce a value for its range. On the first page of the voice mode button, it is possible to change from single to dual or to split exactly as we do with the voice mode select buttons. The chosen voices appear in the appropriate column, voice A, voice B. On the next page, we can set the total volume for the particular voice. This parameter appears in the single mode and allows you to set relative levels for single voices. In the dual mode, a balance parameter is included in addition to the total volume. The balance parameter enables you to set the relative volume level between the two voices. We learned this function early on when we did our very first edits. The last voice mode parameter in the dual mode is dual detune, which enables you to detune the frequencies between voice A and B. In the split mode, as in the dual mode, you can control the total volume as well as the relative balance between A and B. The last parameter in the split mode is split point. One important thing to remember is that in the split voice mode, the split point is fixed at middle C. You can change it in this parameter but you will only be able to store it if you're changing it from within a performance edit mode. There are two ways of changing the split point. One way is using the data entry controls. A second way is by simply depressing a key after you have accessed the split point mode. The first key you press after accessing the split point mode becomes the new split point. The next parameter we're going to discuss is microtuning. The new DX7 makes it possible to customize alternate tunings. Tunings other than the equal tempered scale we're accustomed to hearing. On the microtuning page are stored 11 alternate tunings plus two memory locations for user programmable tunings. Experiment with the alternate tunings to get yourself accustomed to what they sound like. But first, turn on voices A and B. Let's try experimenting with the quarter tone scale. as well as the eighth tone scale.
Now let's examine how one goes about designing a microtuning themselves. We return to button 14, the tune button. Microtuning is programmed along the same lines as fractional scaling. Instead of three note ranges, there are three notes. The middle one is active and the one we will edit. The ones to the left and right simply give us a frame of reference for the active note. The active note displayed is middle C. We can control its coarse tuning. As well as its fine tuning. The amount the frequency is offset is displayed below the note itself. As in fractional scaling, we can select the active note in two ways. We can change it using the internal cartridge keys. Or by holding down a note and pressing either the internal or cartridge key. The note held becomes active. As a brief example, let's design a diatonic scale using consecutive chromatic keys. We'll start with C. We make it active by holding it down and pressing either the internal or cartridge key. Let's leave C where it is, but change what would be C sharp to a D. We simply alter its coarse tuning using a data entry button. Now let's turn what would be D to an E. Similarly, we change what would be a D to an E using its data entry button. Next, let's change what would be a D sharp to an F. And finally, what would be an E to a G. We can store our customized microtuning either in the two user program banks within the internal memory or the cartridge memory, or on a properly formatted RAM cartridge, which will contain 63 microtunings. Let's return to the microtune button, number 29, and examine its other pages. EG forced damp is a feature that will force a note to re-trigger that would otherwise not. Even though the DX7 2 is a 16 voice synthesizer. With certain patches, particularly those with long sustains, it is possible to use up all 16 voices. When that occurs, the 17th note and the ones following it do not automatically re-trigger their entire envelope. You can override that function and force them to re-trigger their envelopes by turning EG forced damp on. The next parameter under the microtune button is note shift. In a dual or split mode, note shift enables you to offset the transposition of both A and B.
The last page in this parameter enables you to name the performance. The routine is the same as naming a voice. Let's talk about the pan functions on this instrument. First of all, you're only going to hear the stereo panning if you're listening through independent left-right outputs or through the stereo headphones. Next, make sure that the light above the pan button is lit. If it is not lit, even though all your pan settings are set for pan, you will not hear the pan effect. The first pan parameter is range. Range is simply the amount of the panning effect. The next function is pan select. There are three pan select functions, LFO, velocity, and note number. When pan is set on the LFO, the left-right pan will be controlled by the parameters in the LFO. If we access the LFO, we can change the speed of the pan by controlling the speed of the LFO. The next kind of pan is velocity. In this mode, the left-right pan is determined by the speed with which you strike a note. The third function is note number, in which the placement in the stereo spectrum is determined by where on the keyboard the note is played. There is a fourth control, the pan EG, which enables you to design a single envelope which will describe the shape of the pan in the stereo spectrum. This envelope is designed along the same lines as the pitch envelope, where the level of 50 represents neutral, or the center. We can design a slow pan from left to right by first lowering level 4, the point at which all envelopes begin, then raising level 1, and then slowing down rate 1. Listen as the note travels from the far left to the far right, finally landing in the middle. The panning envelope works in conjunction with the first three types of panning, the LFO, velocity, and note number. So it's important to keep in mind the other influences over the stereo pan. There are four panning modes which determine which voices, A or B, receive pan and how they are panned. Mode zero is the mix mode and treats both voice A and B as a single voice, as if there was a single output. With two different patches in the dual mode, listen as each voice is panned simultaneously. The next mode pans A and B independently. Thank you.
In mode two, voice A has panning, voice B does not. In mode three, voice B has panning, A does not. There is one other control for panning Continuous sliders can be set to control panning in real time. There are two mini buttons. We've already examined how to change the transmit channel and the receive channels, as well as the omni mode, on or off. The next page enables you to assign MIDI controller numbers to external controllers. The parameters that are controlled by these external MIDI controllers have already been set in button 26 on the MIDI in control page. Note the number 19 in brackets is an assignable controller number which was set on this page, MIDI button 1. These two controller channels can be set independently for A and B. The other two parameters are the continuous slider controller channels. These numbers affect the parameters that are being affected by the continuous sliders when receiving MIDI data. And they also enable the controller sliders to control external MIDI devices. Note that when the continuous slider controller channels are set from 5 to 8, only MIDI transmission is possible. From 9 upwards, MIDI information is both sent and received. The next page in MIDI button 1 contains these parameters. Note on off can be set for all, which means all notes will respond to an external MIDI device, or odd, which means only odd notes will respond to MIDI information, or even, which means only even notes will respond to MIDI information. These last two modes, odd and even, allow for interesting possibilities when performing with a multi-instrument MIDI setup. The next parameter controls program change transmission. In the normal mode, when you press voice number one, you will send program change voice number one. In the programmable mode, it is possible to reprogram the voice numbers so that when accessed they send alternate program change numbers. This is achieved on the next page. In brackets are the actual voice numbers. Below those numbers are the programmable transmit numbers. In order to change the program change number we use our data entry controls. Now voice one will send voice two. One quick note. From any play mode, it is possible to send a program change number in this manner. By holding down the play mode button and punching in a three digit number. If we want to send program change number two, we punch in zero, zero, two using the voice select buttons 0 through 9. As soon as you press the last digit, it will automatically send a program change number. The last parameter on this page is local control on or off. With local control off, 
the synthesizer will no longer respond to the keys themselves. It will, however, respond to an external MIDI controller. The last button, MIDI number two, allows you to set these parameters. Device number refers to the system's exclusive ID number for particular instruments manufactured by Yamaha. Receive block enables you to determine which block of 32 voices will receive a voice parameter dump. This page allows you to transmit voice information. You can send the information in the edit buffer. You can send voices 1 through 32, or you can send voices 33 through 64. This page allows you to send performance information. You can transmit the performance information in the edit buffer, or you can transmit all of the internal performance memories. This page enables you to transmit microtuning information. You can transmit the microtuning that exists in the edit buffer. You can transmit the two microtuning patches in the internal memory, or you can transmit the microtunings that exist in the cartridge. This page enables you to transmit system setup information. System setup information is global keyboard information, such as MIDI send and receive channels, as well as PAN information and the cartridge bank number. And incredibly, friends, that's it. Obviously, there's a lot more to learn about this instrument. I've done my best in the time allowed to give you as concise an overview as possible. Fool around with it, experiment with it. The most important thing is that don't be intimidated by this technology. This is still an instrument. And you should use it to make music. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about the New York School of Synthesis and the classes we offer, drop a letter to the New York School of Synthesis, Post Office Box 878, and Sonia Station, New York, New York, 10023. Or call 212-323-8056. And we'll try to answer your questions. <laughs>